And so welcome back. If you will turn to page 66 in your textbook, we're going to actually look at a couple of issues with loops. One of those being we have to avoid the idea of something called an infinite loop. So in other words, we want to make sure that we have an exit clause out of our loop. So we have to know that we use some kind of a sentinel value, and we have to have some way to increment and change. So I'm going to start a new program. So File, New. And I, of course, I've got a template hiding in here. But I'm just going to grab a, a new file to start with. And, and again, just getting in a habit of using those. So I can create comments, text comments. And so I'm going to create one that we can see what happens when we have a infinite loop. So they have a program that we look at on page 67. And so we're going to use pieces of this. And we're going to look at how we can control a loop and how we can stop it and how we can use some, some not intuitive methods so we have a negative condition always present until we, we change our, our mind. So so I'm going to copy some print statements across just because it makes life a little easier and you don't have to watch me mistype everything. So here we have our hero surrounded by a massive army of trolls. So somebody had apparently read Dungeons and Dragons or Lord of the Rings or one of those. And so we're going to set up some variables. And so we're going to say health is equal to 10. And so a lot of games have that kind of structure where you have some health or life or something. And so we're going to do that. And we're going to say trolls are equal to 0. And damage is equal to 3. And so now we're going to create a loop. So we're going to do something over and over again. So while health does not equal 0, so as long as health doesn't equal 0, we're going to run this loop. And so in this loop, every time it executes, we're going to put trolls equal to trolls plus 1. So in other words, we're going to add we're going to add one value, and we're going to say health is equal, if I spelled it right, is equal to health minus damages. And apparently it's too early in the morning for me to type the word health. So every time this runs, it's going to take three away from whatever our health started at. Okay, so we're changing this value for this sentinel value. And then we're going to create a print statement. So we're going to print So in this case, we're going to grab this and say, all right, your hero swings and defeats an evil troll, but takes damage, so we're going to get that value. And then it's going to tell us how many points they're going to take away at each, each piece. So this will run as long as it doesn't equal zero. So seems like it makes sense. Every time we, we attack a troll, we get some kind of a, a damage value. So print, and then we're going to say, you fought a great fight, comma, but you died. So, and then we're going to have our input that we leave open at the end of our program. And so I need to save this, run module, OK. And I'm going to save it then under Documents in Python. So I'm going to call this Hero. Oh, I don't know. So I have an infinite loop somehow. But I changed my sentinel value, right? 
I have it decreasing. So why is this program running forever and ever and ever? Well, logically, I did take out a value. And I said, OK, I'm going to minus damage. But here's the problem. I said, only while it's not equal to 0. Well, first time it runs, it's going to be 10 minus 3, so it's equal to 7. Then it's equal to 4. Then it's equal to 1. Then it's equal to negative 2. Holy cow. So we don't have it logically done well so that it's ever going to stop. So we have to take into account those issues. So if I change this really quickly and I just said damage is equal 1, and I run this program, notice then it runs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 times, and then exits because your damage is. But it has to actually get to the value of zero. So if I run this at four or any other number that skips past, I'm going to end up with this infinite, infinite loop. So the way to stop that, of course, control C will break that loop and we can actually then stop it and we can take a look at it. So one of the things we do then, we, we have a program and we know that something is wrong with it. We want to put in some kind of a trace. And so I may want to put in here, just because it's in this, in this line right here, I may say, all right, let's do, just so I know what's going on, I want to print the value that we're looking at. And you can see what happens. So I need it inside my loop. And we're going to print health. So I print it, and now I can see really quickly what's going on. OK, now I'm up to negative 834. So we can kind of trace. So putting in those trace comments is a really great way when I have a loop running so I can see what's going on, and I can try to figure out a, a, better, a better model to do that. So we can fix that program. So we could fix it by changing that damage. So that it, we make sure it comes out. But the easiest might be, so while health, maybe instead of a not equal to 0, not equal to 0 can work. But what if we just changed it to greater than zero? And then no matter the amount of damage, so if we had a variable amount of damage, it's always going to work. So we could run this. And no matter what we change that damage to, whether it's one, so it's a small change in the program, but we go from a a infinite loop that we can't stop to suddenly our program behaves. And so it's catching those little nuances sometimes that we have to worry about. So the book goes in and we talk about that idea of making comparisons. And so we have a program called the Matra D program that we want to look at. And I'm going to drag it across so you guys can see this one. So this one says a couple of things. It says, print, welcome to the expensive food place. We're quite full. How many dollars did you slip the maitre d? So you have an input. And we have to do the integer of it because we're taking a text value in. We always input as a text value. And we're calling that money. And then we're asking the question, if money, wait a minute. So if money. So how does this function? So 
this if statements always have to evaluate to true or false. So let's run this program and let's see if we can figure out what's going on. So I'm going to run F5 and it pops up and says, how many dollars did you slip the matri d? And if I just hit enter, it's going to break, right? All right, so let's run it again and let's see if we can come up with a solution to how this works. So how much did you slip the maitre d'? So if you've been in a fancy restaurant recently, we had to tip to get in. Let's say we had to tip a $20 bill. Oh, I'm reminded of a table. Interesting. So we're going to run it again. How many dollars did you slip the maitre d'? Zero. Oh, please set. It may be a while. But if I look at my value up here, all we say is, if money. We don't say if money is greater than or anything. So what we're really asking, does money have a value? So if this condition is true, we do this action. So as long as there is some value in money, that this will equivalent, become equivalent to true. So those true-false statements. Now, quite frankly, just because I like it very clean when we do it, I would probably write if money greater than zero or some other expression, but this actually works because we're treating that value as a condition. So whatever value is, we need to be able to evaluate whether it's true or false. And so if you look at the bottom of page 71, so the rules for what makes a value true or false are simple. Any empty or zero value is false. So if I put in an empty value or a zero, it's false. Anything else will come out as a positive answer. So a true or a false. So if it, if it comes out to true, then we can run the, as I'm reminded, here's your table, because we get that. So as we create programs, sometimes that's a useful way to do that. All right, so on the top of 72, it says, all right, creating an intentional infinite loop. Oh. So there are some interesting times where we may want to create an infinite loop on purpose. And so let me create a new program. File new. Bring it over here. So I'm going to get about 700 windows open before we're done. And so I'm going to create an, a, a program. And I'm going to call this one then finicky counter. And this is so we can show how to use the break. So first thing I'm going to have is I'm going to have count equal to zero. So if I'm going to use a variable, a lot of times I want to set this up where I have that value explicitly stated, especially if I'm going to run a loop. And so my loop here is while true. Huh. Now when I use while true, that means that this loop is going to always run. Because I'm not really evaluating anything, I'm just saying, hey, something is true and we're going to keep running that loop. And we'll show you that here. So I jump down here and we're going to say, so count equals count plus one. Or you can use in the book, they call it count plus equals one. I'm just used to, to doing it this way. And then I'm going to have a couple of if statements in here. So I want to... I want to take a look at it. So I'm going to create an if statement. So I'm inside the loop, so notice my indention. So if count greater than 10, we're going to do something. And we're, what we're going to do is we're going to do break. And so break will pause that loop. Okay. And then we're going to say, if count is equal to 5, we're going to continue. 
And then we're going to print our count value. So we want to see what happens. And let me grab my code here. Close a couple of these windows. Yes, I'm okay with killing it. So I'm just going to copy this so I don't have to retype it. And that goes at that indent. Okay, so let's take a look at what's going on. So this loop will run, and it's going to run continually because we don't have any way to stop it normally so as long as it's true so we've created a loop that will run forever we say count equals count plus one so we go from zero to one if count is greater than ten we're gonna break if count is equal to five we're gonna continue hmm. okay so let's see what happens when we run this And I saved it as count, maybe. And, oh, interesting. So it runs, and it says 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So let's look at that logic again. So while count equals count plus 1, so every time it goes through there, it adds 1. The, this first if statement, so if count equals greater than 10, is going to break. So break pulls us out of the loop. And if count is equal to 5, we continue. So if we get to 5, we jump to the top of the loop. Continue jumps us back to the very top of the loop. So we can break out of our loop. Now, I will say that this isn't probably the best techniques in a lot of cases to do those, but we want to show you that we can get in and out of those if we need to. So, what we a lot of times use this for isn't for creating the logic of a program. What we actually use these things for in a lot of cases are error trapping. So, we create loops and we maybe we make a, a routine at the bottom of it. So if we do something wrong, that there is a safety mechanism or a fuse that will let us out of the program. So maybe we know that this count should never exceed a thousand. Maybe we're counting through patients and we know that we'll never have a thousand patients. We could use this as an escape. So if we did something wrong, it would escape out of this loop and the program could continue to run and maybe even flag us and send us a message going, hey, you've got an error condition in your program, and we ran into this way to, to do that. So um, loops are, are a great, exclusive, wonderful thing. One of the things we also need to work about or think about is multiple conditions. So when we did the pseudocode, we had to do them in a, in a series. And you had to ask multiple questions. And then we finally said, you know what? We can combine multiple conditions and put them together. Well, nearly every programming language allows you to do that also. So we're going to look at one, a program here. And we're going we're gonna to take a program. And this program does two things. So it's going to ask two questions based on your input. So, I'm going to do a couple of pieces. So I'm going to delete, and I'm going to put in, so this is our members only program. And so we're going to actually do a couple of print statements. So at the very top, we're going to print and say that we are Members only club. And not the hideous JCPenney's jackets from hundreds of years ago. So we're going to get a couple of variables. So we're going to have one called security. And we're going to set that equal to zero. So we put in a, in a value. And we're going to say username. And we're going to set that equal to a, a blank text string. 
So that way when we use them in the future, so now we're going to do a loop. So we're going to say while hmm. Okay. So this looks a little different. We haven't used this structure before. So username equals blank and then while not username while not username colon we're going to say username equals input please enter your username all right so let's look at this statement here and so we're doing that evaluating and so what we're really saying is as long as you don't you put in something this loop will exit but while nothing is there that loop is going to run and so it's a handy way we can get people to actually input something. Otherwise, it will, it will stay in that loop. And so if I look on the bottom of page 77, they explain, okay, here's a, it's a true-false table again. And so while there's not a username, that loop says, all right, that condition is true, and I'm going to run it. So... This will run over and over and over again until, until we get an effort that we can actually use. So if I don't enter anything or I enter in a blank string, it's not going to, to take in that username. So my next statement I'm going to have down here, so now we've got a value in username, is we're going to use an if statement. So if username is equal to, and remember we have to use the double equals, and we can put in a value, and it, we're just going to grab the ones out of the book. So, m dot Dawson. But here's the fun part. And so we're going to use and, and if I capitalize, and I wanted to emphasize it, but I forgot that, that Python has to have that as a lowercase. But notice it's it also turns orange in there. So it's a key phrase, and so we can have a second condition and password is equal to, remember before our program where we had password equal to secret? So if both of those conditions are true, then we're going to print hi Mike And in this case, we'll set security equal to 5. So we have some security value. So we have a couple of different values in there. So we set security to 0, username to 0. So using the same technique, notice here we have two conditions. So we said username and password. So we're going to do this same technique here. So control, copy. And we're going to get them to type in a password also. So, so while password username, and we're going to change this one to password And then we're going to say, please enter your password. So we use the old copy and paste, edit it, and now we have the users will input two different things. Well, we can test our code. We can test our code. And it's really a good idea as we're building this that you can do that. Now, chunk. All right. So right now, the only way this is going to work is if your name is m.dawson and your password is equal to secret. So we're going to run this really quickly. And it says, please enter your name. So I'm going to try this as m.dawson. And it's going to go, oh, there's an error. All right, so why does it give us an error? Well, we didn't define the word password up here. So 
We did username, but we didn't do password. So I'm going to put it right up here. Is equal to blank blank. So in other words, we didn't create a value. So it's asking this question and doesn't know what it is. So we're going to run it again. Enter your username, m.dawson. And our password is secret. And it's going to say, hi, Mike. So in other words, we get some result. Well, a good rule of thumb anytime we do an if statement, we also want to do an else statement. And that else cleans up anything that doesn't cycle through. So if we had multiple elifs, and then we have a catch-all. So our else statement then is going to be print you are not a member of the members club. So, and again, we go through and we're going to test it. Our username is 4 and our password is 3 and it's going to say you're not a member of the members club. So we could add a whole bunch of other pieces in here. So we could add in a bunch of LF statements. And in fact, we do. And so we have an S. Meyer, S. Myota, Mr. Wright. And then we even have a guest. And a guest and password are, are both in there. And so what what's interesting here is I want to look at this particular one. So we're going to look at guest and password. But we changed this key phrase. So what did we change that to? We changed it to an or. So in these, so anytime we say an and, both conditions must be true. And we can try this. So let's run this really quickly and we'll, we'll do some experimenting here. So enter username. So I'm going to put m.dawson, and we know that's right, but I'm going to put in a password of secret meeting. And when I do that, it's going to jump me to that else statement because both pieces of this statement are not both true. And if both pieces are not true, then it goes down to the else statement. Well, I'm going to try one of these because we changed it just a little bit, run module. And I'm going to do guest. And so guest I know is correct, but I'm going to call it the password of secret. And I know that that's not correct. If I look here, it says guest, and the password is also equal to guest. But look what happens. And it says welcome guest. Oh. So it ran this block here because we had an or statement. And so either this piece or this piece or both would allow us to actually run that. So a couple of things that, that show up here that I think are interesting. One, these comparisons, we need to make sure we're really careful. So I'm going to run this program again. And in this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also say my, my username is m.dawson, and my password is secret. Well, if I just look at that, that looks like it should be the same, m.dawson and secret. But remember when we looked at those ASCII tables, capital letters are different than lowercase errors. So when I run this, it's going to say, nope, you're not a member. Because it's looking for only that uppercase M and the uppercase D for Dawson. So there's a lot of pieces in there. So try and experiment with those. If you're not, if you're not using those and experimenting, you're going to be in a, in a little bit of trouble here. So, so what we're really doing, this that loop is a pretty easy way to get you to, to uh, ask and grab new information. So if I don't put in, so if I run this, six, five, oops, wrong program. Never mind, too many things open. All right, if I run this program, 
So, members only club, please enter your username. And if I don't put in a value, notice it's just going to keep asking repeatedly for me to get some value. And it'll go on forever because that loop won't execute until I put in some value. And as soon as I put in any value, then it says, please enter your password. And so those are a really helpful way to do that. So the book talks a lot on page 80, 81 about the idea of pseudocode. And we've went over that over and over and over again. But on the bottom of page 81, we're going to create a game that's going to guess a number. So in other words, the computer randomly selects a number, and you're trying to guess that number. So, my first attempt, and a really good one to think about is, all right, so we're going to say, pick a random number. While the player hasn't guessed the number, have them guess again, and then congratulate the player. So that's a really basic outline. If I flip the page, we've refined it a little bit. So on page 82, there is a chunk of code pseudocode where we've added a little more content. So we said, all right, welcome the player to the game. Pick a random number. Ask the player for a number. Set the number of guesses to one so we can keep track of how many guesses that this player happens to run. So then we have a set a loop. because We could run it without a loop. If we said we're only going to have 10 guesses, you could do this without a loop. But that loop allows us to repeat our actions and makes it a little more efficient. And then it says, all right, in that loop, while their guess is not equal to the number, in other words, they haven't got it right, if the guess is greater than the number, tell them to guess higher or guess lower. Otherwise, tell them to guess higher. There's only two conditions there. So if one's not true, the other one has to be. Get a new guess from the player. Increase the number of guesses by one. Eventually, congratulate the player on guessing the number. And let them know the player how many times it took them to guess this number. So, so we kind of have an idea. And so the first thing we want to do anytime we're going to create a program is we're going to create, and I'm just going to delete this section in the middle so I have my pieces here. So a lot of times we want to put that comment block at the top. So again, name, just kind of out of habit. And what are we doing? So this is a guess my number program. So we can put in more details. I think that's, you guys can kind of have the idea. But we know if we're going to do an import number, we have to do that import random. And then we want to have a section. So this is the game explanation to user. And so the more of those comments you put on, it really does help you because at some point, at some point you're going to get confused and go, man, I just don't remember why I did any of this. So here I have a section that's called explanation to the user. So I'm going to do a print statement and do some explanation. So guess my number, the computer will tell you higher or lower. And you could go into great detail and make it look really nice. So now we have to set initial values. And again, I put in a comment code just because it's a great way to explain that. And so in this case, we're going to create one called D underscore number. And we're going to set it equal to random dot rand integer. And we're going to do that between 1 and 100. So in other words, somewhere between 1 and 100, we're going to set the value. And we're going to take the initial guess. So your first guess is going to happen here, that priming the pump input. And so input... Please enter a guess. 
Now, we really need the the integer value of that, not just a value, because what you're going to get is a text string. And so we could either do the guess equals the integer guess, or we can put it all together, and we can put it in, in one piece in here. And it's, it's kind of clever if we do it that way. So we're going to take the integer of the input. Make sure you have two closing parentheses. So you're taking the integer value of whatever this particular model is. So now we get the value. And we also want to know how many tries there are. So we're going to set tries, because they have to have at least one try equal to one. So that's our initial priming the pump. We get some information. The users have that. And so now we can start creating our loop where they can guess repeatedly. So while, and we're going to take use base it off the value of guess because that's the thing that's going to change. So while guess does not equal the number, so this loop will run as long as you don't get the right value. And then we're going to set up this statement for an if statement. So if guess greater than the number, so then we're going to print lower. Well, if that value isn't backspace, so if it's not a value that is else, else, it's going to automatically then have to be print higher. There's only two conditions in here that we can use. So that loop then, the other piece we need, because we're keeping track of tries, is we're going to have to say tries equals tries plus one. But we need one more piece in here. And so because we're basing it on, the whole point of this loop is every time we run that loop, we ask for an input. Well, I'm going to grab this input here, and I'm just going to pluck it in right there. So I copy and paste, same input statement. Makes a lot of sense. I just copy it back and forth. And so then we can, we can do some pieces outside of that loop. So right now it functions. So we could put a print statement in. You guessed the number it was Get a space in their space and then the number you guess the number you took this many tries and then put in tries so this program should run so this might be an interesting exercise we have a we have our first thing let's see if it will actually run if i didn't type anything really weird so it set a variable number now we're asking about it and so a good strategy we're going to guess right in the middle. So we're going to say 50. And so oh, it says higher, so we're going to go 75. Ooh, we're higher again, so let's go 85, 80, 77, 78. And that number was 78. It took this many tries, one. Oh. So. I have a problem with my code. That says I only did it in one try. So let's look what I did, because I'm assuming I made a, a spelling error 
And I did. I spelled it instead of tries, I spelled it as tires. So tries equal tries plus one. Run that again, and we'll see what it's going to get. So we get some kind of value. So you could do it this way. So now I've got lots of values in there, 30, and it was 35, and now it tells me you tried it 11 times. So we can even do some interesting pieces. So we could make this more interesting. So maybe we take this game and we said we wanted to create this similar game but we didn't want them to have unlimited attempts because that's going to be, some people might just start at one and try every number because they're not paying attention to the end. If I wanted to change this, so I would actually get a limited number of tries, we could do that. We could make this an and statement. So we could say and tries less than 10. So now, two things have to be true. Now, we have to change a couple of things down here. So here we would, we would want to figure out some method to justify whether they actually got that or not. And so these could be a set, a set of if statements now. So if tries less than 10, print the number it was, blah, blah, blah. Otherwise, you lose and you'll have to guess again. So you could, you could fix this bottom piece, but now it would actually have two conditions in there, and so it would exit out. And so we can, we can look at that, and you can actually try some code. Um, so if tries less than 10, you guess the number, it was blah, blah, blah. You took this many tries and you could do an else, so else print you didn't guess the number, you had too many tries. And you could leave them hanging because they would never know what the number is. So if I ran this one really quickly, so now, works the same way, enter a number, oh, I accidentally guessed the right number. Let me run that again. Interesting, I just randomly guessed one, so please enter a guess. Nine, ten, and at the tenth one, it's going to go, uh, you didn't guess the number, you had too many tries. You took this many tries, 10. But it didn't actually show me what the number was ever. So I have no idea what that value actually was. But we took a basic game. Now we're making it a little more elaborate. Now you've, you've changed it to where you only have 10 tries to get the number. And so you could make it even harder. You could have that number between 1 and 1,000, 1 and 50, whatever you'd like to do to make that a little tougher. So all of those parts go together. all of those parts go together and now we have to come up with a, a program of our own and that program on your own says you're gonna simulate flipping a coin a hundred times and you're going to then keep count of those and you're gonna have to come up with how many heads and how many tails there are hmm. interesting So, all of these pieces we have. So, when I, when I sit down and I look at that pseudocode, and I know that I'm going to have to, to loop this, I'm going to, let me grab notepad or something. There we go. So, I know that I want to write a program that's going to flip a coin a hundred times. Okay, so flip a coin 
program. So I know I'm going to have to have an introduction, and so I'm going to put in comments, introduction block, I know that I'm also going to have to probably import some kind of library. So import any libraries I need. I know that my the goal of my program is to flip a coin. So if I flip a coin, I probably am going to do it some number of times. So I'm going to have to create a loop a loop to run some number of times. In this case, I think it's a hundred, but you could do it any number if you wanted to run it a thousand. So I'm going to say inside this loop then, you're going to have to have some kind of loop counter. You're going to have to have a counter for heads. You're going to have to have a counter for tails, and you're also going to have to have, so you're going to have to see, so create random heads or tails. So you're going to create a random head or tails. You're going to have a loop counter that you're going to increment. You're going to have a counter for heads and a counter for tails. So at some point, I'm going to have to probably use an if statement. So I'm going to create an increment. And if that works, then if tails counter for tails increment. So my loop's going to end, and so now I need to print out a nice display of total number of flips, number of heads, number of tails, now, when you get done, you might want to double check. Does the number of flips equal the number of heads plus the number of tails? Since we only have two conditions, heads or tails, notice what I can do up here. So I don't really need another if statement. I could simply do an else statement. So if it's heads, we're going to count up the heads. Else tails, and we're going to have a counter for the tails in there. So this program will stretch you a little bit. Hopefully you can, we can work on it. You've got all of the pieces in this chapter. And in fact, our guessing game that we just looked at really gives you a lot of those pieces if you want to look at it and what you need to do. So, a couple of notes on here. Make sure your program runs. Run your program repeatedly. Test it. Make sure that it works. Submit only the .py file, that Python file you save. So make sure you know where you're saving it. Make sure that you comment in here both what you're doing and at the top you have the comment block of your name and the assignment. So it's got to be .py. It's got to have comments. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab those all in bulk, grab them out of there, and if they don't have comments on them, I don't know whose they are. Because I have I will pull them out that way. And it's just good practice getting into putting in comments. You can put in comments anywhere. So here I could say this statement below imports 
the random library. So notice we have here, we say set initial values, how you create that. So there are literally, literally a million different ways that you could run this, even this small a program. So when you look at it, and one of the things we're going to start doing is we're going to display your code on the discussion board outside of class here fairly soon. So you're going to start seeing your code going up the week after so other people can look at it at it also. So that is our, our task for this week.